Hey everybody, um, back in Jerusalem. And you know that a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about the reverence of the Father. And we were right here. And if you look behind me, you'll see the same view. It's the same place where Jesus, our Messiah, where he lived, where he came to die, and where he rose back to life for the church. How exciting is that? I couldn't be more excited to be here in this very special place, bringing to you the gospel in a book in the Old Testament that I believe is gonna change your perspective on how you share the gospel with people and especially with Jewish people. And it's gonna tie in to everything that we spoke about last time with regards to the reverence of the Father, with regards to taking that veil down and having an entrance into the Holy of Holies, with regards to having an awe for our Father God. And most importantly, I wanna show you how Jew and Gentile is meant to be together as one new man, to be the bride for our bridegroom. And I believe there's no better story in the Bible to tell this through than the book of Ruth. I think it's the greatest book when it comes to showing God's heart for everyone here on earth. So we've just had Pentecost and Shavuot. So we know that in the church, you will celebrate Pentecost, which happens on the 50th day after Passover. And in Hebrew, we call that Shavuot, it's weeks, seven weeks, 49 days. On the 50th day, we have the Feast of Weeks here in Israel, which we've all just had and everybody enjoyed cheesecake because that's what you do here. You eat cheesecake on Shavuot. So on Pentecost, I know you all went to church and everybody was just talking about how the Holy Spirit came upon the people in that upper room and Peter preached that sermon and 3,000 people came to faith. Well, that happened right behind us. How cool is that? This is where God chose to send the promise, the down payment, the spirit to ensure us that what we're doing here on behalf of God is exactly what we're supposed to do. So I'm gonna to read to you right in the beginning from the book of Ruth in 1.1 and it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife, and his two sons. Two words I just wanna pick from there, Bethlehem and Judah. Right in the beginning of the book of Ruth, we're given two indications that we're gonna learn something quite special when we read this book. Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, and Judah, we know the tribe that the Messiah must come from. King David from the tribe of Judah. And as I'm speaking, there was this beautiful wind that just came over where we're standing right now and I can see the trees moving. And it's just so special in Jerusalem to speak of the spirit and to have the wind move right through us. Praise God, which is so cool. So to cut a long story short, as we unpack a bit of Ruth, there's a few deaths and we're left with three key characters. One of them, Naomi, the other one, Ruth, and another character called Orpah. Now, Ruth and Orpah were the daughters-in-law to Naomi. Naomi, a Jewess who was obviously Jewish from Israel, and Orpah and Ruth, not Jewish, but actually from Moab. And we would refer to them as Moabites. And that's gonna get interesting in a while. And what happens is that they leave Moab, according to the book of Ruth, it says that they realized God was now doing something again in Israel. The famine was over. They leave Moab and they go towards Beit Lechem, the house of bread. But there is a situation that takes place where these two daughters, Ruth and Orpah, have to decide their fate. What are they going to do? Because their mother-in-law, Naomi, looks upon them and she says to them, go back to your gods. Go back to Moab. You don't need to come with me. I'm on a very difficult journey and this is gonna be a very difficult time for you. You've already lost your husbands. You don't need to follow me to Bethlehem. And what happens? Well, one of them kisses her on the cheek. Her name's Orpah. And she says, I'm out of here. I'm going back to my gods. I am going back to Moab. What does the other one do? Her name is Ruth. She kisses her mother on the cheek and says, take my hand, take my arm. Where you go, I go. Where you die, I'm gonna die. The God that you serve, I'm gonna serve. 
two completely different reactions. Now, here's what I want you to see, okay? In the Hebrew, when Ruth speaks of, I go where you go, I serve the God you serve, the word that she gives God in the Bible is Yud, He, Vav, He. We would say Yahweh, okay? It's a tetragrammaton. It's that famous way of spelling out God's name. But Yahweh or yud Hey vav He, it's very peculiar to me that a Moabite would be using this for the name of God. Because actually, the times where we see yud Hey vav He used with regards to a relationship with God, the Creator, it's only when somebody really knew Him very intimately, on a very personal level, would they refer to Him as yud Hey vav He. So what is a Moabites doing using yud Hey vav He in this narrative? Well, I believe I have a sneaking suspicion that it's because she married a Jewish man. Yes, they were living in Moab, but she married into a Jewish family and she must have been taught all about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so I believe she got to know him in quite an intimate level. And because of that, she uses the name yud Hey vav He. Now, what happens next is actually the most interesting thing for me. And I'm going to challenge you all listening right now to ask yourselves, where are you according to what Ruth just did? So in the Hebrew, it also says that Ruth Davka Naomi. Okay, now that word Davka actually means the word clung. She clings to Naomi. So first she talks about yud Hey vav Hey. She talks about the most intimate name that one can give to God. And then it says that she clings to Naomi. Now, when I read that, I really chuckled to myself because Davka is also kind of like Yiddish slang. Now, when you grow up Jewish, you hear the word Davka all the time, but it's not used to, to, uh, to mean the word cling or to cling to something. The word Davka is when you do something like irritatingly on purpose against what everybody's telling you, you still do it and you're adamant you're gonna do it and you're a little bit pig headed about it. That's what Davka means growing up in a Jewish household. So when I was little and my dad would say to me, please wear the blue shirt to shul, to synagogue. And I put on the black shirt instead. He would say, you're so Davka, irritatingly on purpose. You do the opposite of what I tell you. So when I read this, I thought to myself, how cool. Ruth Davka Naomi. It's almost as if I'm seeing in my head this cool image of this woman irritatingly on purpose against everything she's ever been taught, against everything she knows, against the God that she used to serve, against the nation that she used to belong to. She says, I'm not going back to them. I will dafka cling to you, Naomi, because yud Hey vav Hey, because I've met the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and there is nothing or nobody or no circumstance that will make me walk away from him. And I challenge you here today because Orpah was also in that same family. And Orpah heard about God. And Orpah chose to go back to Moab. And Orpah decided to leave her mother-in-law. But Ruth decided to cling with everything inside of her to her mother-in-law. And that's what I want to challenge you right now. Those that are listening, are you clinging to God? with everything that you have? Are you willing to give up everything that you knew to follow God? Or are you so quick if you get a better opportunity to just kiss him on the cheek and go back to your former life? It's a big question to ask. And I hope you're seeking and searching in your own hearts right now to ask yourself that question. Are you clinging or are you going back to your former life? I hope you wanna cling. And so the story continues. And Ruth and Naomi are having a conversation. Now Ruth needs to go into the field because she needs to glean from the new barley harvest that just happened at the time, okay? So Naomi reckons that Ruth is the one because she's younger and because she's stronger, that she is gonna go and glean from this field. Now something really beautiful happens here because Ruth goes to glean from the field 
And who is she hearing about when she goes to this field? She hears about a guy by the name of Boaz. Now in the Hebrew, Boaz is called Hagoel, which means Boaz, the Redeemer. Isn't that interesting? So the first guy she hears about in this new field that she's going to in Beit Lechem, the house of bread, is a guy that's called the Redeemer. Why is he called the Redeemer? Well, the reason is, is that because there was a law at the time where if your spouse passed away, you could have what's called a kinsman Redeemer, which would mean that somebody that was family of your spouse that passed away could actually end up marrying you and redeeming you and turning you from a widow into somebody that's now married. So let me get this straight. Are you telling me, Aiden, that there was a way that if you lost your inheritance, if you lost your spouse, that God could use somebody to redeem you from that hopeless situation in Beit Lechem, in the house of bread? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's what the book of Ruth is teaching us. And so she hears about this Goel, this Redeemer, and she goes to reap some of the barley harvest. Now, the way that it worked in those days is that if you had a harvest, the strangers would come to the corners of the harvest and they would reap from the corners, away from where the family was reaping from the center of the field. So that's where Ruth would have wanted to go, the corner of the field, reap with the strangers, collect what she can get and go and feed her mother-in-law. But guess what? An interaction with the Goel, with the Redeemer, changed the complexion of the story because it was told to Ruth that she was not to go and glean on the corners of the field where the strangers are gleaning. She was invited to glean with the family members, with the closest people to this Redeemer, right in the center of the field where the barley harvest was its greatest. And do you know that he even told the workers, pull out some of the barley and leave it so that it would be easy for her to pick up. Now, I don't know if this is talking to you yet. A stranger that gets invited in to the center of the action to pick up a harvest that you didn't plant, but that God wants to give to you anyway. Is this starting to ring a bell? Well, maybe it should because Ruth being a Moabites, being a Gentile, a Gentile was invited with the Jews in the middle of the harvest to reap what they hadn't even sown. I believe we're starting to see a picture of God, what he called Abraham. He said, Abraham, father of many nations. We're starting to see that picture being formed right here in the book of Ruth. Now, remember earlier when I spoke about Ruth knowing yud hey vav -Hey? And why would this Moabites know this name? Do you wanna know something interesting? That in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse three, God makes a decree and says that no Moabite, not even for 10 generations would be allowed into his presence or into the assembly of God. Why? Well, because we know that there was incest at play that gave birth to the nation of Moab. And so there was a curse upon that nation. And also when the Israelites were in the desert and they needed food and they needed to be helped, the Moabites refused to help them. So God placed a curse upon it and said, and even until the 10th generation of a Moabites or a Moabite, they are not allowed into my sacred assembly, not allowed into my presence. So it's even more strange that this Moabites not only knows God, but knows him intimately that she uses this name, yud Hey vav Hey. Again, are we starting to build a picture here? God is using the downright outcast, the ones that weren't allowed in his presence. And he's saying, actually, I've got a plan for you. I want you to go to Bethlehem, to Beit Lechem, because there's a new story there for you. And I don't just want you to go there, but I want you to meet and hear about a Goel, a redeemer, who's going to redeem you, even though you think you've lost all your inheritance, he's gonna make things right. And Jew and Gentile are gonna be harvesting together in the same place. I hope it's starting to get pretty clear. So now in Ruth 4 verses seven, it says there that it was the custom in former times in Israel Concerning, concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction that one took off his sandal and gave it to another. Weird, right? So what happened in the book of Ruth 
is that in order to bring in this law of, rede of redemption, of redeeming, when they agreed upon that thing, they took their sandals off and gave it to one another as like an act that this was actually coming into being. Remember in the last sermon we heard that when Joshua stood before God, that he had to take his sandals off? Well, here in this story, they're taking their sandals off again. So it's just a reminder that when we're in the presence of God, we should be in awe of him. We should revere him. We should fear him, not to be afraid, but to be in awe of who he is. But listen to what Ruth does. Ruth goes in the, in the middle of the night. And if you read it in the story, she goes and she sits at the feet of Boaz. And he doesn't even know she's there. But there she is sitting at his feet. Sitting at the feet of the Redeemer. And when the Redeemer wakes and sees her sitting at his feet, he decides he's going to change her life with just one moment. And it's decided by him. It's decided by the taking off of a sandal because he understood the story of Elimelech and how, how these husbands died and how Naomi brought Ruth to Bethlehem and he heard about this righteous Gentile that was prepared to leave her gods behind and go with the Jewish woman to the house of bread. And he says, this is the reward. I'm gonna marry her. Remember what we spoke about last time? Bridegroom and bride. Here we have a story of a Gentile who gets invited in to be the bride and a bridegroom who's called the Redeemer, the Goel, who says, come and sit at my feet. And when I see you there, I invite you in. I make you my bride. A new marriage is formed. And why? Because he wants to restore the inheritance that we lost when we were unbelievers. And I'm not talking about financial gain here, guys. I'm talking about the greatest inheritance you will ever receive, eternal life. You will receive nothing greater in your lifetime than the gift of eternity in the presence of the Father. That's the great gift that we get given. And so let's put this all together. A Gentile who didn't know God, who was banned from his presence, got to know him and decided she would give up everything, everything she ever knew just to follow him. Now, some of you know me well, some of you don't know me that well. But when I got married, not one member of my family stood and watched me get married. I got married alone because I too had to make a decision. I had to ask myself, am I going back to my old life? Am I going back to my other gods? Or am I gonna receive the invitation given to me and go to the house of bread? And I decided to go to the house of bread too, to Bethlehem. And we're going to get to why that is such an important place in just a moment. I had to give up everything. Was it worth it? You betcha. It was the best decision I've ever made. The greatest moment in my life was when I had the revelation that God the Father sent the rescue mission from heaven to redeem me. I have a goel. I have a redeemer. You have a goel. You have a redeemer. And all God's asking you to do is turn back from who you are and go towards this new place he wants to show you and go and meet him. Because just like Ruth the stranger, he doesn't want you harvesting with strangers on the corner of the field. He wants to invite you into the center of the field to be with his family, to glean from the harvest that you didn't plant, that we don't deserve to even harvest, but because of God and his grace, he'll give it to us anyway. And so the story gets even better because after we realize how we can be redeemed and after we realize that there is a redeemer waiting for us. And after we realize that God's true heart is to bring Israel and the nations, Jew and Gentile, to bring all people together as one new man. After we realize that, after we know that, we can get the picture of what the bride should look like. And I'm gonna read something that's just so cool. Ruth 4, 18 to 22. Now these are the generations of Perez, 
Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nachshon, Nachshon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse. And the last word in the book of Ruth, Jesse fathered David. The last word in the book of Ruth is the word David. Why? Because if it wasn't for the marriage of Ruth and Boaz, then there's no line to King David. And if there's no line to King David, then there's no Messiah called Jesus. You know, in the book of Matthew, it says these are the genealogies of Jesus the Messiah, the line of David, the line of Abraham. So the last word of the book of Ruth gives us the greatest clue of what God can do if we let him because the God that we serve, the father that we're supposed to revere and be in awe of, does not only want to redeem you from your past life, but he says, I will not just redeem you, but I will redeem you. I will place you in the center of my field. You will glean with my family. You will receive from the barley that you don't deserve. You will sit at my feet. I will make you my bride. I will get into a covenant marriage with you. And I will take you as a former Moabite who was isn't allowed in my presence and I will redeem that to such a degree that from your loin will come King David. How's that guys? He doesn't just redeem us. He restores us exceedingly, abundantly more than what we could ever hope for or ask. Whatever you think God is doing big in your life, close your eyes and dream again. It's bigger than you think. It's always bigger than we think because he's bigger than we will ever know. And our God, in that same line of what he did with Ruth and Boaz, wants us together, bride and bridegroom. And the bride, a picture, Jew and Gentile. Those excluded, being brought in. How exciting. Aren't you as a church excited that we can be taught and we can learn about this one new man, that we can pray for Israel. Why? Because we know that our Jewish brothers and sisters are half of who we need to be and the nation's the other half. And Romans 1.16 says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then for the nations. We know that there's two parts to this, guys, and I'm inviting you to be a part of it. So when you support us, when you pray for us, Know that that's Jew and Gentile coming together like God wants. Isn't that cool? That we can stand together as the bride. Isn't that cool that we can receive the offer of engagement and say, yes. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to say, I'll let you know tomorrow. We can say, yes. And take it from me who stood alone at his wedding, that the gift God gives you is greater than anything else you will ever receive. Don't worry about what you will lose. Just know there is so much that you will gain. You will be in the center of that field. You will harvest with his family and you will know the greatest barley you've ever had because it will be given to you straight from heaven. That's my promise to you. If you decide to join the kingdom of heaven, if you decide to choose Jesus as your Messiah, because right behind me, our Goel, our Redeemer, went to that cross at Calvary and he was nailed to that cross so that you and I can be reconciled to the Father, the greatest act. And in just a moment, we're going to remember that story together because I'm going to do communion with you guys. So I want you to press pause on your TVs right now and I want you to join me. I'm going to go stand by an olive tree with a beautiful view of the old city. We're going to take communion together and we're going to remember that story of how he bled for us, how he was broken for us, so that we can be made whole, so that we can be in this marriage covenant with God, bride and bridegroom for all eternity. See you in a sec. Dan willen we heel graag contact met je, want dan begint er eigenlijk een reis. En we willen je op weg helpen in die reis. Er staat ook een link in beeld, daar kan je eventjes naartoe. Of meld je misschien even onder de uitzending, maar liefst even gewoon via... De link die aangegeven wordt. En dan kunnen we ook wat uh, materialen met je gaan delen. En we ja, willen gewoon heel graag van je horen. En voor het geven vandaag. Wij uh, zijn ook gewend om te geven. 
En daar had ik ook een prachtige gedachte bij. Er stond dat in de tijd van de hongersnood... Uh, ging, uh, een, een, uh, de zoon van Abraham ging zaaien, Isaac ging zaaien... en er staat er dat er honderdvoudig oogst kwam. Waarom dan honderdvoudig oogst? Omdat God op zijn best is in tijden van hongersnood. Dus toen hij, toen hij daar ging geven, kwam God met de ultieme reactie als oogst. Maar da, daar, daar zie je weer, dat is niet alleen maar... zodat Isaac kon zeggen naar de rest van de wereld... Hey, 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 ik heb een God en jullie niet, ik heb gezaaid en ik heb honderdvoudig oogst. Nee, als je honderdvoudig oogst hebt, kan je heel veel weggeven. Kan je heel veel anderen helpen. Zo zie je dat God op zijn best is in tijden als deze... En als je zo geeft, vandaag geef dan met je hart. Geef alleen wat je op je hart hebt. Ik doe het ook even. God wil gewoon iets geven waar jij blij van wordt. Waarvan jij weet van de binnenkant. Maar als ik dat nu doe, dan weet ik, dit is goed. Die, dit is iets waar God iets mee kan. En dan zeggen we ook, Heer, we vertrouwen op u voor onze voorziening. U bent ons inkomen. We zijn niet afhankelijk of niet... niet uh, uh, wordt onze toekomst en onze voorziening wordt niet bepaald... door wat er in de wereld aan de hand is. Niet door een pandemie. Uh, niet door uh, hoe, uh, wat er met bedrijven gebeurt. We vertrouwen op u voor onze voorziening. En we zeggen dank u, Jezus. U hebt dat gekocht en betaald voor ons. Amen. En dan zien we je heel graag terug bij een volgende uitzending.